Although the generation of Dionysius of Halicarnassus and Livy may have sealed what we think of as the official accounts of early Roman history, they were not necessarily the last writers to venture into what Livy once described as the mist of early Roman history. Plutarch, one of antiquity's most renowned writers, wrote biographies on Greeks and Romans whose lives best exemplified virtue and vice. While he himself was not a historian, Plutarch's lives of Romulus and Numa Pompilius helped to illuminate the later development of the historical tradition regarding early Rome, while his related lives of Camillus and Poplicola illuminate the early years of the Republic, a period scarcely better documented than the preceding regal period. Here we examine Plutarch's life of Numa Pompilius, where we see Plutarch take up the banner of Greek pol cultural politics and examine Rome's mythical second king as a platonic philosopher king. Plutarch was born around the year 46 CE and died around 119. One of the most internationally famous intellectuals of his day, he interestingly enough spent the vast majority of his life in his native city of Chironia. Chironia is one of the smaller cities in Boeotia and its only real claim to fame was being the site of a famous battle between Philip II of Macedon and a Greek coalition led by Thebes and Athens. When someone once asked him why he did not go to Rome, Alexandria, or some other more famous center of intellectual activity in order to further his fame, Plutarch responded that he was a patriot of Chironea and that he would not willingly deprive the city of one more son. While Plutarch did live in a fairly remote area when compared with many of the other famous intellectuals of antiquity, he did possess an incredible personal library, and he was, in his own right, an incredibly learned and well-read man. Unlike many intellectuals of the Greek world, Plutarch was very well versed in foreign cultures and languages. We know for a fact he knew Latin and was very familiar with Roman culture, but he often uses examples from different cultures, which many of which are now pretty obscure. He talks about Phrygian customs and what the Carians were up to. So Plutarch is the kind of guy who had a massive personal knowledge of the world, one which enabled him to overcome the limitations of living in Chironia and to write works which have had enduring value in the many centuries since he lived and wrote. In fact, because his works have survived to the present, or at least many of them have, he still remains one of the most popular and well-read authors of the modern period, at least among those who have survived from antiquity. Plutarch is also interesting in the sense that he very much valued his place in the politics of Chironea much more than his potential place in imperial politics. For all practical intents and purposes, as Chironea's most famous resident by a mile, he was effectively mayor for most of his adult life. He was on city council, and in many ways, he was the only reason why anyone would ever visit the city. As I mentioned at the outset, Plutarch is not a historian, but rather more of a moral philosopher. His goal as a writer and a teacher was not so much to elucidate the details of history, but rather to find the morals within it, or simply to teach philosophy directly in order to better the souls and lives of the people with whom he had contact. He has two surviving works, broadly speaking. The best known of his surviving works was something of his secondary project the parallel lives of eminent Greeks and Romans that sometimes translated. And what this is, is a comparative series of biographies where Plutarch will compare one Greek and one Roman. He'll find two people who he thinks are fairly similar, give their lives in full, and then have a short comparative section to basically say which one of them was the more virtuous of the two. And given his personal bias, which is heavily in favor of the Greeks, he often comes out on the side of saying that the Greek in this comparison is the more virtuous individual. 
Once in a while, he'll throw the Romans a bone, but for the most part, the Greeks come out looking a little bit better. His other bro work, broadly speaking, is actually more of a collection of works. The Moralia is 78 moralizing essays on many topics. Perhaps the best known of these is a scathing critique of Herodotus. And as some people have pointed out, one of Plutarch's real bones of contention with Herodotus is that he feels that Herodotus is a little too rough on the Greeks who chose to resist Persia. In his own time, Herodotus was only writing a generation or two later, and it's very clear that his sympathies were very much with the Greeks who repulsed the Persians and not the other way around. But for Plutarch, living in an era where Polis patriotism had dwindled away to nothing, he felt that it was incumbent upon him to really try to uphold the honor of the polis, as he had done by remaining at Chironea, despite it being a small hole in the wall. And so he really rails against Plutarch, I guess, uh, excuse me, against Herodotus in his essay. And a lot of his critiques, aside from that, are also not terribly good. If anything, what he does is he raises the question of who was a better historian himself or Herodotus, and unfortunately for Plutarch, that is not a comparison that he fares well in. That being said, although Plutarch is not a historian by craft, and while he is more of a moral philosopher than anything else, the fact is that he is still a very useful source for history, so long as we use him with due caution and rely on him more for events and, say, the personalities and customs, rather than, say, specific details such as the name of a particular institution. Back around the middle of the 2nd century BCE, the Greek historian Polybius, pictured here, had more or less initiated the effort to Hellenize the Romans, to make the Romans seem more like the Greeks so that the Greeks would be more willing to accept them. Dionysius had taken that and tried to Hellenize the Romans in order to effectively shoehorn the Greeks into Rome's early history and take credit for a lot of what they had accomplished, while also arguing that the Greeks and Romans should be regarded as equal. Plutarch will take up Dionysius' quest to Hellenize the Romans, although his attempts will not be quite so heavy-handed. By Plutarch's time, it had become very, very clear that Rome was here to stay, and also the Greeks were being treated just fine. So this was not as pressing a concern for Plutarch as it was for someone of Dionysius' generation. That being said, Plutarch, as I mentioned earlier, was a hardcore fan of the Greek polis, living his life as if he lived in the 5th century rather than the 5th century BC rather than the 1st or 2nd century CE. And so he too wants to make sure that the Romans know that perhaps they owe much of their success to the Greeks. At one point he mentions that there's no way that Numa Pompilius, the subject of his life, was a student of Pythagoras due to chronology. But he does suggest some things which make the reader think perhaps the Romans still owe a whole lot of their wisdom to the Greeks. The first thing that Plutarch mentions is a possibility, something that he drops pretty quickly but still brings up, is that there was a famous Pythagoras who would have been a contemporary of Numa, and that was Pythagoras the Spartan Olympic victor. So he says perhaps after winning the Olympics, this Spartan Pythagoras decided to travel to Italy and he met with Numa at some point. It seems like a pretty big stretch, but Plutarch is looking for any potential avenue to leave the door open to the possibility that the Romans are a little more Greek than they're willing to admit. He also says that Latin used to contain more Greek words than it does now, and he is specifically referring to the era of Numa. Now, the problem with this is twofold. One is that, as we've mentioned, there was not a great knowledge of what Latin was like in this early period. There aren't all that many samples of Latin writing. There are some inscriptions, but they're fairly minimal, and there certainly are no written text. So Plutarch is effectively just kind of saying this and assuming that it's true rather than being able to back this up in any way. 
The other problem is that in the time of Numa, this would be the late 8th, early 7th centuries, Greek cultural influence was not what it was later. Most of the great intellectuals of the Greek tradition, including, of course, Pythagoras, had not yet been born. So there would be no reason to assume that in central Italy, the Greek language would have such great cultural purchase. Every opportunity that he gets, Plutarch will point out any parallels between something that Numa thought or did and something that the Pythagoreans would think or do. So, for instance, at one point he talks about the Temple of Vesta, which was originally built by Numa, and he says that the flame in the Temple of Vesta was in the center. Well, the Pythagoreans, he tells us, always put the flames in their temple in the middle. Coincidence? Maybe. Or maybe, somehow, Numa still benefited from Greek wisdom in some way that's unclear, but still real. Who knows? Let's leave this door open, please. Toward the end of his life, after he's narrated the part where Numa had died, he cites Valerius Antius, who said that later on Numa's coffin was unearthed, and when they opened it up, they didn't find a body, but they did find books of Greek philosophy. And this is an interesting choice on Plutarch's part, because there's a very similar story in Livy, dating to the year 181 where a coffin was found, and they opened it up. There was a body. They presumed it was Dionys uh, It was um, Numa, and that it had 14 books in it, seven books of Latin related to jurisprudence, and then seven books of Greek philosophy. So why go with Valerius Antius's version of events rather than Livy's? Well, simple. Valerius Antius's version of events is much more receptive to the idea that there was a bigger Greek influence in the deep past. It helps Plutarch advance his narrative of Greek cultural politics more than a narrative which includes seven works of Latin lawmaking. Historically speaking, the first thing that really jumped out at me in Plutarch's life of Numa Pompilius is that Plutarch has a very different account of how Numa came to power when compared with Livy. In Livy's account, Numa was effectively seen from the outset as the obvious successor of Romulus. He was the guy the Sabines most loved and the one Sabine that all the Romans admired. So in a unified state where you have Romans and Sabines, this is the obvious go-to choice. In Plutarch, Numa is much more of a compromised candidate. Each side earlier had their own favorite sons as choices, and neither side was able to convince the other of that person's merits. Then they began to search, the senators most likely, for someone who was acceptable to both sides, and the person they found was none other than Numa Pompilius. Plutarch emphasizes something about Numa that Livy was not too keen to talk about, and that is that Numa was the son-in-law of the last Sabine king, Titus, Titus Tadius. Since his father-in-law's death, Numa had retired to the countryside and had never made any problems for Romulus. He had been living in retirement for years and had no intention of returning to Rome and to politics. Perhaps Numa's lack of causing problems for Romulus and the Romans is something that really endeared him to the Roman people. They thought that Numa Pompilius was one of the good Sabines, if you will. And for the Sabines, he was someone who had been one of their own for years. He was the son-in-law of their last king, and he was a man who had cultivated a reputation for having great virtue. Eventually, the two leading candidates, the Roman and the Sabine, got together and they agreed that the man for the job was neither of them, but rather Numa, as the one guy who could keep the Roman-Sabine alliance together. And so they traveled to meet him, and at length did prevail upon him to accept the crown. Numa made a great show of resisting the crown, and said that he simply wasn't interested, that a man would be crazy if he were to give up something that he loved, such as his quiet and his private life, and trade it in for the hustle and bustle of politics. 
Ultimately, however, the two candidates and Numa's own family, including his father, were able to convince him that it was the right thing for him to do to go to Rome and serve as king. Numa ultimately accepts because he felt that it was his duty to go to Rome and serve as king in order to do the best job possible and in order to influence the Romans for the better. It was this reluctance, the lack of any personal ambition, and Numa's sense of public responsibility, which really, I think, intrigued Plutarch and make him see in Numa the Platonic philosopher king. Although Plutarch has some fairly eclectic beliefs and is by no means an orthodox Platonist, he is still operating within the Platonic tradition. One of the things that Plutarch believed in is the ideal of the Platonic philosopher king, that is the ruler who was guided by virtue and wanted to instill virtue in others through his enactments as a ruler. For Plutarch, Numa is the philosopher king come to life, and that is why he finds Numa to be such a fascinating subject. Much like the historian Livy, Plutarch believes that Numa's goal was to use religious norms and the terror of punishment from the gods in order to temper the warlike Roman spirit. If the Romans felt like violating an oath would bring down the wrath of heaven, then they would not do it. If the Romans felt like they needed to make a sacrifice before engaging in some action, then perhaps the time they would spend performing a ritual might prevent them from doing something more hasty. If they had to obey certain forms, they'd be less likely to engage in precipitous actions which might have negative consequences. We have to remember that if we take the timeline of early Roman history seriously, then Numa would have been maybe just shy of adulthood or barely into adulthood at the time of the abduction and rape of the Sabine women, and so he would be well aware of the need to temper the Roman spirit to some degree. And that was fundamentally the task that he took upon himself as king. In many ways, he saw himself more as a teacher and as a moral instructor than he did as a ruler in the traditional sense. The challenge for Plutarch then becomes explaining exactly how Numa became so wise. Plutarch, as a Greek patriot, needed to explain how it was that a non-Greek who had no possible exposure to the Greek philosophical tradition could have become so wise in ways that were easily recognizable as wisdom to the Greeks. He mentions something that Livy and other Romans believed, that Numa was just naturally virtuous, and that these virtues were more or less just part of his intrinsic nature. That's one idea, but Plutarch is looking for something a little more in line with his own ideals. Now, Plutarch believes that ultimately all virtue stems from the gods, and that all knowledge also depends on the gods, even if this is a fairly indirect thing. And so, one way to explain Numa's wisdom is to have him get that wisdom directly from the source. One of the stories in Plutarch's life of Numa includes a time when he is trying to add the Aventine Hill to Rome, and he happens to trap and detain two deities, Picus and Faunus, and he won't let them go until they reveal to him divine secrets. So it is by this means that Numa acquired at least some of his wisdom. And if we combine him having direct contact with gods, with him being naturally good, and then maybe we take a few of these stories that Plutarch provides of Numa being associated with Greek wisdom, then maybe together all of those things add up to the creation of the perfect philosopher king in early Roman history. The person Plutarch compares Numa to is Lycurgus, the guy who invented the great Retra in Sparta. Lycurgus fundamentally remade society in order to make Sparta a place which produced professional warriors. In many ways, Numa does something like the opposite of what Lycurgus did. He takes a group of men who know nothing but war, and 
and makes them more balanced. He gives them a peaceful side. Both sets of reforms are equally sweeping, at least as portrayed by Plutarch. One of the first things that Numa does, which is incredibly basic, is to set up parcels of land for farming. Arguably, this makes him a cultural hero for Roman agriculture. So far as we know, at least in the literary tradition, there may well have not been farms for the Romans before Numa. This also might play into Plutarch's idea of Numa as someone who, whether on purpose or by accident, exemplifies Greek moral philosophy. Many of the Greek philosophers were people who reacted against democracy, and one of their complaints hinged upon the idea that when cities turned to the sea and they created an economy which created sort of well-paying blue-collar jobs, that this undermined the morality of the state by causing people to move away from agriculture. What they really meant is that by empowering poor people and making them more powerful, this undermined the ability of large landowners to simply dictate policy without challenge. So Numa, by making the Romans mostly focused on agriculture, may have, to Plutarch, done something that Greek philosophers thought was wise. That is to prevent the rise of a well-organized and wealthy working class that is not tied to the land. In the city of Rome itself, there was an uneasy internal diversity along ethnic lines, according to Plutarch. The Romans and Sabines were still very conscious of who was who and who came from where. And the same applied to the other cities that the Romans had absorbed already, most of which were admittedly rather small. One of the ways that Numa sought to break this down was to institute the guild system. So various professions would organize with members of the same profession to set standards and to self-regulate. And according to Plutarch, the primary impact of that was not to organize labor, but rather to create new identities which would supplant the old. And this also meant that because people started to focus on their identity as a craftsman rather than their identity in terms of what part of the surrounding area they had originated from, this allowed the Roman identity to take hold and to drive out its rivals. In many ways, this part of Plutarch's analysis is actually very sophisticated. Because if we look at what a lot of modern writers have written about identity and how it works in the modern world, most serious intellectuals today recognize that there will always be some kind of identity politics at work because people like to latch on to larger identities and take credit for the achievements of this group that they identify with. So even if you were to, say, eliminate nationalism, you would still have other things that people latch on to as being part and parcel of who they are. So, in many ways, what Plutarch is saying here is completely in line with the thoughts of modern intellectuals and is surprisingly sophisticated in terms of its understanding of how people think and operate. Numa also established a group called the Fecials. This is the Roman group of official heralds, and it is their job to negotiate with neighbors when there are conflicts, and also to formally declare war so that it is witnessed by the people they're declaring war on, and the gods themselves also witness these declarations. This seems like a very basic and fundamental thing, and you would think that with as many wars as Romulus fought, that he would have had heralds in place, but apparently not. Also, it is worth noting that the Greeks already had a system kind of like this, where they would have formal Karakis who would perform the same task as the Fecials. So, uh, you could even make a case that by laying this out the way that he does, Plutarch is once again doing a little bit of Greek cultural politics. Although the Romans were very, very emphatic about the way in which things had to be handled, about procedure, and for them, declaring war through the 
accepted means or the means that they had laid out was extraordinarily important in terms of keep, keeping themselves on the right side when it came to their relationship with the gods. As an institution, the Fecials very much lie at the nexus of the two things which make Numa Pompilius an impactful king. He was very much obsessed with getting religious ritual right and with making sure that the Romans had institutions by which to make peace. Beyond the Fecials, however, Numa did many other things which helped to establish religious norms for the Romans. As in the accounts of Livy and Dionysius of Halicarnassus, Numa's signature achievements were in the realm of Roman ritual. In fact, in many ways, the account that Plutarch provides here in the life of Numa Pompilius is in many ways a truncated and summarized version of what appears in Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who goes into a great deal more detail. Numa built the famous temples of Vesta and Janus. He established, among other offices, the office of Pontifex Maximus to supervise the entirety of Roman religion. He also created all kinds of different priesthoods. We're not going to go through most of them here because a lot of them are not terribly clear in terms of what they're supposed to do. He also appointed a priest to honor Romulus, who was deified by Numa as Quirinus. It is worth noting, however, that Quirinus was originally a Sabine war god, something that we now know due to linguistic study. But by the time of Dionysius of Halicarnassus and Livy, the Romans had been trying to work everyone into their tradition as much as possible, so they kind of melded together this traditional Sabine war god with Romulus. They knew that there had been a cult of Quirinus, but why would there be a cult of a Sabine war god if they were the Romans and if they had conquered the Sabines? So basically the story then became, oh, well, Romulus was our great warrior king and then he died and we deified him as Quirinus and that explains why Quirinus was someone who had warlike attributes. Problem solved. Perhaps the signature achievement for Numa, at least as far as Plutarch was concerned, was creating the 10-month calendar. Um, when Livy covered this, he was really interested in how Numa was able to control which days were public and which were private. For Plutarch, the emphasis is on how Numa and his priest are able to control when inter intercalary months are added in order to make the 10-month calendar work. And because he very much admires Numa, he says that this absolute mess of a system was a massive improvement on what came before and how it was a pretty good system overall, even if it did require significant fixing from Julius Caesar at a later date. Numa's calendar had 10 months, each one of about 30 days, and you can imagine why that is problematic. Um, it did not really track very well with the solar year. So frequently there would be dates which were completely inappropriate for the season that they fell in. And so the priests would have to get together and fix things. And this was a tradition that many of the Roman power elite would defend because they themselves were part of this priesthood. And it gave them a certain amount of power to be able to hold these meetings and then be the ones who address the problem. When Julius Caesar became dictator, one of his signature deeds was to rationalize the calendar and add months in order to make it work better. In fact, Caesar's calendar was so successful that with only minor alterations in the Middle Ages by Pope Gregory, it has remained our calendar to this day. So, when Plutarch says that Numa's calendar was effective, I have to agree to disagree. Numa Pompilius reigned for 43 years, and during the entirety of his reign, Rome was at peace. That's a pretty impressive accomplishment when you consider just how warlike Romulus was, and how, no doubt, many of Rome's neighbors must have had some beef. However, Numa, through whatever means, was able to keep Rome at peace for the entirety of his 43 years in power. One of his most famous constructions was the Temple of Janus, 
which featured a gate. When the gate was closed, Rome was at peace. When the gate was open, Rome was at war. And it was a pretty rare occurrence in Roman history for the temple to be closed. Livy tells us that only right after the First Punic War and then during the time of Augustus were the gates closed. And Plutarch cites those two examples clearly taken from Livy. Livy's agenda, of course, was to talk about how great Augustus was at bringing peace, and whether or not Plutarch shared that particular opinion, he did effectively end up comparing inadvertently Augustus with Numa Pompilius. Not only did Numa make the Romans more moral and give them the gift of peace, but his influence was so great, or perhaps just the warlikeness of Rome was so great, that by bringing peace to Rome, Numa was able to bring peace to all of central Italy for the entirety of his reign. None of his neighbors engaged in aggression against each other or the Romans while Numa was there. His influence was so great that people were moved and motivated to also seek out peace. Of course, this is a very romantic view of the potential of a philosopher king, but if you are as idealistic as Plutarch is when it comes to the potential power of a good man exercising absolute authority, then perhaps this makes perfect sense from that perspective. Plutarch, insofar as the evidence allowed, tried to make sure that all of his lives covered the entire life of the person he was talking about. The focus, as always, was on the adult years of his subjects, with a heavy emphasis on the deeds which made them famous, the virtues and vices which either drove them or brought them down, and the way in which they died. For Plutarch, his interest in Numa is as a man of peace, and so it should come as no surprise that he is at pains to show that Numa had a peaceful death which was befitting of the peaceful life that he led. From retiring at an early age to the countryside, to bringing peace to Rome as king, Numa then went on to die quietly in his bed. This is in stark contrast to other lives of people that Plutarch covers. At the outset of his life of Numa, when Plutarch is discussing the succession to Romulus, it is very clear that unlike Livy, who is skeptical of the claim that the Senate murdered Romulus, Plutarch very much believes that the Senate murdered Romulus. And part of the reason he might believe that is because Romulus had led such a life of violence, and so had probably pissed off a lot of people, and had a few rivals here and there who might wish to see him go into the mist, as it were. Numa, when he died, died very slowly and gradually, according to Plutarch. He didn't burn out, he faded away to borrow and adapt the words of Def Leppard. This is significant because this is a, the kind of death that one typically attributes to someone who lived wisely and well, rather than someone who lived a life of violence and adventure. If we compare with Pericles and Solon, both of whom Plutarch also wrote about, we see that both of them also met ends which were fitting for men of peace. Pericles was actually not really that peaceful, but when he caught the plague at Athens, he didn't die immediately, but instead weakened gradually, which was pretty unusual for a plague victim, and only died after his considerable reserves of strength ran out. This was, of course, also despite his relatively advanced age at the time. Solon is someone who is not a person who had a famous death, but he is very famous for the advice and admonition that he gave to King Croesus of Lydia. Croesus was a proud, wealthy ruler who hosted Solon and showed him all of his treasuries and palaces and all of that, and then asked him, Tell me, Solon, you are a well-traveled man. Who is the happiest man you have ever encountered? And then, of course, he stood back and no doubt smiled smugly, expecting to be named as the happiest man in the world. 
And then Solon listed three sort of random Greeks that Croesus had never heard of as the three happiest men. Croesus was confused and a little angry, demanded to know why Solon had chosen these men. And, of course, Solon responds that the reason he chose them is because he knows how their lives ended. One of the men he listed was a guy who met his end in battle, but not before he got to see all of his sons grow up and become men in their own right. Some of them even had their own children. In the ancient world, infant mortality was extremely high. So this would have been a fairly rare thing. So for this man to, uh, for someone like Croesus or any other man to claim happiness, it would be premature since no one knows how their life will end yet. You can only claim to be happy when you're dead, when you know that things ended as well as they went to that point. So, that, of course, that story, of course, comes to us from Plutarch's least favorite writer, Herodotus, but nonetheless, it does seem to have had an indirect impact on how Plutarch and subsequent generations viewed one's wisdom and how a fitting end should be. In a literary sense, Numa needed to have a peaceful end in order to bookend his story in a way which is satisfying. He was a cultural hero for peace, and so his entire existence, not just, say, his prime, needs to be consistently peace-oriented. We also don't learn anything about his youth. Maybe he was a wild man as a youth. Maybe he fought like a beast in those wars between the Romans and Sabines before peace was declared. We don't know. But even if Plutarch had access to those details, he would definitely exclude them because they don't fit his themes. A couple of other little details before we call it quits today. One of Numa's interesting laws that he passed was a regulation on mourning. As I mentioned, it was very common for people to have to bury young children uh, because infant mortality was sky high. And Supposedly, Numa forbade any mourning for children under the age of three. For children ages four to ten, the parents were allowed to mourn them for a number of months equal to the number of years that they lived. And then once a person reached the age of ten, that was the maximum age for which they could be mourned, or maximum time of number of months they could be mourned. This also applied to spouses. Widows were supposed to mourn their husbands for 10 months, and of course, Numa specified widows more so than widowers because typically women married older men, and those men would die before their wives. If a woman wanted to get remarried prior to that 10-month period, she would have to perform certain rituals, but there was a path to do that and then get remarried before the 10-month period had expired. Another weird thing that Plutarch includes that Numa supposedly legislated is the notion that wooden bridges are sacred to the gods and cannot be destroyed. Now, what the meaning of that was, I don't profess to know, but it is interesting insofar as the Romans had all kinds of odd little religious beliefs, and many of them beggared an explanation. And later authors, Plutarch, Dionysius, Falconassus, Livy, and others, were often at a loss to try to figure out what these things meant and what purpose they served. But at any rate, such are the challenges of doing early Rome. Because if there was an answer, it had to lie in early Rome. But because even the, the priest who inherited offices that dated back to the mist of early Rome weren't really able to explain a lot of this stuff. So authors like Plutarch and his predecessors often had to make things up in order to try to make things make sense. So those are all of my thoughts on Plutarch's life of Numa Pompilius. Next time we'll take a look at modern views of early Rome and see what modern scholars tend to think about this early period in terms of what was going on and I guess what you might say, what was really there?